we go. Kiki, thank you for coming on the show. I got to start off with the first question, which is, what is your favorite superhero? Thank you so much. Um, I would say my favorite superhero is, I think, the everyday human. Mm. Because we all have the potential to be superhumans. And we all have powers within us that can define us or not. And I think the superhuman power, the superhero power, is in these small acts of kindness. It's in taking care of somebody when they fall down, or it's if you see an accident happen, stop and help. And to me, it's it's the the warrior mothers who are raising a kid all by themselves, and that showcases a superhero for me. So yeah, I'm I'm not very much into the super yeah. superheroes in the classical classical sense awesome well we'll circle back to the warrior mothers in a minute but so the everyday human finding their power and starting to to really be who they should or can be at their fullest potential how did you start on your journey where was the beginning to everything that you're doing today um yeah it's it's funny i i really like spoken word poetry and there's one girl she once said like every story has a beginning a middle of and an end but not necessarily in that order Mm. so looking back and where is my beginning i think maybe it hasn't begun yet maybe Mm. i'm right in the middle or maybe i'm at the end like i don't know it's all subjective (laughs) but i think for me um, I think the the start of this whole journey was not a very pretty one. And it was a story of, of trauma, of abuse. <clears throat> and I would now think, okay, that is where it, for me, started to shift. That triggered me into something so out of this world, so alienating for me Mm -hmm. that I didn't really know who I was anymore. Um, I realized that what I was defining myself as was a circle of abuse that I kept finding myself in and kept looping in. But then the moment I realized something that was after, I would say, my the the last abuse I I have had, um, then I all of a sudden, it hit me really hard because after, yeah, the story is after um, this guy raped me, I didn't really dare to say anything. I didn't do anything. And one or two weeks after, uh, I heard that he raped another girl. Mm. And I think then for me, that circle snapped because it was not me in the loop anymore. It was yeah. other people coming in and other people suffering. Um, I wouldn't say like the same thing, but it all of a sudden clicked inside my head. And I was like, why didn't I say anything? Because this is not just me. It's not about me. It's, it's about this other person, his patterns. And um, I can only have compassion for him to, to make him do these things. He must have had a terrible time himself. Yep. But I realized it clicked within me that I shouldn't be voiceless. I shouldn't not say anything just out of fear or out of anxiety and then i really started processing in that and the first thing that came was really guilt i was filled with guilt i i didn't really see how to get out of that anymore and i i kind of had panic attacks and nightmares and um yeah i didn't really know what to say anymore because i knew that he raped another girl just because um yeah some other people were talking about it Mm -hmm. but i never met this girl um he flew out of the country so i i couldn't really say anything i didn't dare to speak up because he was a colleague and i didn't want to like cause drama at work and stuff like that so but i think this was for me such a crucial moment to realize that um yeah, silence is an act of violence too. And I contributed through my fear and my silence to someone else's pain. At least that's how I saw it back then. And of course, I more rationalized over that. And I, mm-hmm. 
I really try to forgive myself for yeah the decisions I've made back then because I was in a very stressful situation myself. So I can say looking back now, oh, I should have done any, I should have done something, mm -hmm. but I can't really be that person who just got abused herself anymore. Um, so I think that is where it all started. And once I really wanted to get out of that rut, out of that misery, when I started my journey to self-development and healing and, and breathing methods and, and all this type of stuff. So maybe that's the beginning. Maybe it was the end of something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's definitely both because I like to think almost every interaction, everything we do throughout our days, we're a different person than we were before. Yes. So it, it, you know, there's, there's so many ways to, uh, to skin the cat. But one of the things I, I thought you said was interesting was silence is uh, uh, another form of violence or as like people always say, ignorance is bliss. I look at it like ignorance is not bliss at all. Ignorance is yeah. basically you're scared to speak up for whatever it is that yeah. you could be saying. How did you start to, uh, that's such a, a tricky mindset to, to understand that the absence of something is actually the thing that is holding you back versus yeah. something. Well, uh, I mean, I do must give credit to the person who, who said it. Um, it's, it's also from a spoken word poetry a girl she named Blade, Blade Bird, and she wrote a wonderful poem and she speaks a wonderful poem about a similar situation mm -hmm. and I've heard it and then I was like it resonated within me so deeply and she talks about her abuse and about the girls who got assaulted yeah. after she didn't report and for me that resonated so deeply within me that I was like why didn't I report? And then it really started clicking. Like, it is, we need to speak up. Yeah. And even if it's just for one or two people to hear it, um, I think we're made for storytelling. We're oh. made for listening to um, not just adversity, but to be connected this way. Mm -hmm. And through the internet and through... Um, shitty television we are not sharing stories anymore we're yeah. sharing like these these i don't i don't even watch television anymore so i can't give an example <laughs> but this is not the way that we're meant to share if you share if i stand in front of a crowd and i share my my story and i say like okay i've been abused that led me to being depressed that led me to be anxious that led me to be scared there are always people who are in the crowd who say, yes, I recognize depression. I recognize those darker days. I recognize abuse or, or somebody in my family got abused or mm -hmm. this is what we're made for. This is how we connect. So yeah, I think that once I started to recognize that myself, it became easier and easier to indeed live this silence as an act of violence because I started to recognize how much it could give people if you just simply offer that hand of connection. And it's not just speaking, it's yeah. also really listening to their stuff. And then you connect on a certain level of, okay, you know, you're, it's always the classical that like, you're not alone kind of story, mm -hmm. but it's more than that. It's not just knowing that you're not alone. It's knowing that you have a tribe. Yeah. And we are tribal people, so I think that is all where it goes back to. Yeah, and it's fascinating with uh with the storytelling. I mean the rise of audiobooks is like really coming up now. Audiobooks, podcasts and everything. I literally believe that it's because we're we are supposed to hear versus always be reading something. And like for me, I can put an audiobook on two X speed and I crank through these audiobooks like day after yeah. day. Um, yeah. it's just a different way of understanding information. But so you took all that and now you're like, my, I can speak out, I can be me and I can literally break the chains on my mindset and everything. 
when did you then start to actually go into the water and start on that journey? Um, the water actually started before me speaking up. Like I spoke to a few people, um, like a few close friends about the abuse and some of them reacted really negative and asked me like weird questions like, oh, what were you wearing or, or stuff uh, like that. Yeah. And some didn't know how to react. I think that's very normal. Um, yeah. But also some that were really, really supportive. Um, and I think through that, it kind of, I still kind of was struggling with it, mostly alone. Um, and the struggle wasn't necessarily, necessarily the, the abuse itself, but I got really bad nightmares from it. And mm. of course, that caused me to have a lack of sleep. Then you're more prone to depression, yada, yada, yada. It really spirals down. But then um, I saw a Vice documentary of Wim Hof. And he <laughs> said, he said, do my method to become happy, healthy, and strong. So I thought, yeah, like, you know, I'm a bold person. I can do this. <laughs> so um, I started to do the cold water. Honestly, I didn't really do the breathing as much at first because it really like, remembered my body um, as a panic attack. Mm. So I didn't really like the breathing at first. But then when I started doing them uh, with other instructors that were able to say, okay, slower or... Yeah. Um, I started to really like them, but the cold was my first thing. And I would really say from that, I can honestly say the cold has been my lifeline because I really thought, okay, you know, um, I didn't say anything. I'm a shitty person. Maybe, yeah, the world is better off without me. So I kind of was in that kind of mindset. And then I went into the cold. And what I would say now, um, once you're in the cold, there is no way out. <laughs> you can physically get out of the cold, but once you're in there, you have to look within. Yeah. And for me, that was really the first time in months that my mind just kind of shut off, that I was not thinking about the mistakes I made, what happened to me, and the person I wasn't or shouldn't be or wanted to be. I just was, mm -hmm. and this was like a really forced meditation because you get so sucked into the <laughs> moment. You get sucked into being you. Yes. And then I all of a sudden realized that I still have this quiet within, that I still have the ability to, to be. And of course I would say that's not literally one ice bath that told me that. Once I started to do this and once I really held on to this, this quietness, this quiet space in my mind, that I went back and back and back to do it. And um, every time you go into the cold, for me, it provokes another emotion. Sometimes yeah. it's sadness. Sometimes it's happiness. Sometimes it's, it's, it, it provokes something within you. It does something with the core of your being. Mm -hmm. you, you can be scared. You can, like, every time before you get in, your mind is like, Nah, not today, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. I don't have to do this. <laughs> and every time you kind of overwrite those thoughts. So as well, simultaneously as doing the benefits of the ice bath, you kind of realize like, okay, I can think, don't do it, but I can still go in. I can yeah. still move myself. So there becomes this disconnect between what you think and what you're physically able to do. And for me, that, that disconnect was like a little switch that I started playing with. Like, okay, I can think this, but do this. But then how does that translate to my everyday life? I can think this and do this. And it became really like a tool to navigate my world in a different way. And I think over time, once I just thought about the ice bath, and it's like, okay, I'm really looking forward to have an ice bath. And... Then I realized why I wanted it so bad. It's because the ice bath um, really was a space for me where I could be forgiving towards myself, yeah. where I could be in that moment and just really relax and let go. And yeah, once I kind of realized this is, this, is, this is something weird. 
because mm -hmm. once I'm in this big stressor, in this big nature, like um, cold, it's a, it's a force. It's a force of nature, and we just put us in it, like either in an ice bath that's a bit artificial or into the direct cold. Yeah. But it's a force of nature. It's an element as as its essence. Within this, within this stressor, I could be forgiving because it's a stressor. And I was like, okay, it's, it's a stressor and I then can reflect within me. And then something clicked. I was like, but with all of this happening, my life is an ice bath. My life is a big stressor that lays on me rather than, yeah, something that I provoke. So I started to see, okay, why can I be compassionate towards myself in this net, like in this nature stressor, but not in the stressor of life? So I really learned to kind of shift this compassion from the ice bath to, towards me as a person and not the me only in this one particular moment. And maybe it sounds a bit weird, no. but... <laughs> that took yeah. a bit of time for me to realize <laughs> no that is awesome because like yeah the cold water is such an interesting phenomenon because you literally can see the watcher where like the watcher is like watching your thoughts and you're like yeah you're not doing it this time it's like oh we'll, we'll see yeah and like i get some of my most creative uh elements when i'm in a cold shower I don't know why like I do the sauna and then I go into a cold shower and like typically I'm like oh best ideas and I like feel all woozy like maybe I'm gonna pass out too we'll see but all a good idea it's uh it's one of the dichotomies of life is understanding that the the sense is like cold isn't out to get you yeah and that's a lot of times like how people like see the cold like we're raised like okay yeah it's cold outside be careful like stuff like that yeah. Whereas like cold is, it's an intangible thing that is a feeling towards the body. I can't really describe it, um, but it's one of those so interesting things. But now it's evolved so much for you that you're putting on events soon. You were just telling me that you have another event coming up soon. What, what's going on in that event? Where is it? Uh, what's it going to be about? Uh, so yes, actually this event, um, really started for me as, um, yeah, really a hobby, you know, mm -hmm. I just, in a weird way, I was, I was speaking quite a lot. Like I got invited to speak at events, to speak about, yeah, what happened to me and how the cause helped me and blah, blah, blah. And on a way I got really annoyed because I really love events. Like I love these conferences, yeah. people come together, but when I'm speaking, I always felt like, okay, look, uh, I can't really hear other people speak anymore because before I'm kind of not stressed, but I'm just thinking about mine and I do, do want to, yeah, have everything in order to see the technical issues and stuff like that. But afterwards, when I'm on stage, it gives so much that afterwards I'm always like, oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of like, I want just to create an own event with people that I want to listen to. Yeah. So I invited people that I thought had a cool story just because I wanted to listen to them. And then we did the first event, um, which was kind of meant to be uh, pretty small in a, in a space that, yeah, we collaborated with um, to be a trial to see if, yeah, if this thing would work. And then we got the opportunity to host it here in Berlin. So that's where I am now. Um, at a really awesome, awesome, awesome location in one of the, yeah, the most well-known clubs, like, of, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, of the city. <laughs> so it's like at night it turns into a club, and during the day we're allowed to use it for the conference. And yeah, it's it's called uh, Fuck the Blues, the experience. Hell yeah. So it's about um, yeah, how do we stop the winter blues before winter even starts? So it's in November, on the 17th of November, and yeah, here in Berlin. And it's really an event that is focused on experiences. Like how do you give people not just tools and strategies as yeah. most of these conferences do, of like, okay, this works for me and here is what I did. But how do you give them an experience that they then can reflect to on their daily life? 
So within the, within the day, we really try to tackle all the senses. Yeah. Like so, something with herbs, like herbalist is there. With smell, we have a, a device called the Pandora Star, which is a um, like light machine that yeah. kind of alternates your brain waves in like making you see three dynamic dimensional things and they call it like a no drugs dmt experience really so yeah so we have that and then we have somebody talking about fear emotional mastery and some of them are really like hands-on things of course there will be an ice bath um so it's all these experiences packed in a day on how do you really center yourself yeah. And not just in a classical yoga meditation type of way, because I think, okay, that works for some people, mm -hmm. but that doesn't work for everybody. Of course, I think meditation is cool. It's good. And I love meditating. But when I'm in an ice bath, meditation yeah. for me is so much easier. So that works for me. And maybe like this light machine works for somebody else. Yeah. So it's really all experiences to give people to see what makes you tick, what yeah. provokes you to become, yeah, to see this, this light within yourself or this um, yeah, potential within yourself. And that's kind of what the event is about. So it's really exciting. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it seems like a lot of it, it, a lot of it goes to what you're saying, which like meditation is, of course, an internal state. Um, and that's like kind of the yogis, they try to make it like, it's just your internal state, don't focus on the external. But most people understand or have some inkling, of, hey, my internal state is almost always mirroring my external state. My external reality mirrors the internal reality. So a lot of times, like if you get the light right, if you get the cold right, if you get all these things right, then it's way easier to just turn internal because now you just set up that outside to yeah. feel that same way. That's awesome. I yeah, and I think for some people as well, it's it's this not it's not necessarily adjusting the outside, but making them see that they that they can experience something different. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes meditation, um, yeah, has a high line for people to go start it because yep. they're like, oh, I would never like they see the classical yogi. Yeah. And then if you make it more hands-on and you say, no, you can meditate by doing this or this or, yeah. So there are so many different ways of stimulating your inner self or bringing yourself back to resting state that, yeah, we really are planning the event around, just playing around with that. And of course, there are like a, some, some speeches on, but then again, they're very hands-on, they're personal stories. So yeah. we're not really we're not really giving you information. We're just saying, okay, look, this is who I am and this is what worked for me yeah. and try it. And maybe it works for you, but it's not that I give you a list of like a uh, cold shower in the morning, then meditation, mm -hmm. then this and that, and then you bulletproof coffee. And then yeah. it's, it's, it's too much for people. They have to listen to what works totally. for them. So yeah. Yeah. It's a very personalized event, I would say. Yeah. Well, also the structure a lot of time doesn't allow for it like that freedom of consciousness and it seems like yeah. you have a very um cool view on consciousness uh based on what you've been talking about is there anything specific when it comes to how you kind of see uh the inner self uh within you oh that's this is a very tricky question um yes yeah i would say the self within you um I honestly now think back to a beautiful experience he had when I was giving, <clears throat> giving a talk in, um, on the Elevate, Elevate conference in Zurich, which is all about consciousness, elevating mm -hmm. consciousness. Yeah. And I, yeah, I had this wonderful experience with um, like a natural shaman. And I realized through that, for me, the inner state is nothing and everything. Yeah. It's everything and nothing at the same time. And through that, I realized like how much we, we are connected. And maybe it sounds cheesy and maybe it sounds like a bit, a bit out there. But when I think towards myself, mm -hmm. 
it's I think Rumi said it like you're not um, you're not one drop in the ocean you're the entire ocean in a drop yeah. and once you realize that indeed you are everything within yourself you're everything you're the whole universe and every single cell of your being and I don't mean it in that very spiritual sense but literally the basics of our being they are the same and they're yeah. all connected and for me there is no single consciousness i think we are a collective consciousness totally. and um then again I, I really love my sayings um i forgot who said it but um yeah the the saying was the yeah the it's it's a collective universe or, um, oh, I forgot it now. Uh, that's all good. If it yeah. comes back, we can go to it. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. No, I'm huge on sayings as well. Um, I don't know. I guess it, it becomes a habit when you're reading so much and you're like, yes, <laughs> that's the exact thing that I always wanted to hear. Yeah. You're like, boom, okay, put that somewhere. Yeah. I, yeah, I really, I really just love it. And I think, this is the this is the thing like when people start communicating on this on this collective collective consciousness mm -hmm. thing like so much of it seems a little bit out there you know but once i think it's not some uh, for me at least it's not yeah. a feeling that i have 24 7. Yeah. like you know i'm myself i'm in a world of my own um yeah i now know the thing life is a shared experience scattered by individual perspectives mm. so yeah sometimes i indeed go back to my individual perspective on things yeah. i go back to my way of seeing things and then i realize yeah okay it's this world is is my reality like it's it's yeah. how how my past colored it how my vision how my even my on a biological level how i perceive color like yeah. how how light enters my eyes and and all of this but it's not the same for every person but under that under that scattered perspective there is something collective there is something yeah. that we all share and we all have and yeah i'm i'm right now in a state of really seeing what is this collective consciousness and not just from us but yeah. I would say, what is the collective consciousness of all beings? And I think sometimes there, for a lot of people, it gets a little bit out there. But with the Pandora star, I once, um, I think it's now two years ago, when I first uh, laid under this light machine, I had an experience of really traveling back in time, mm -hmm. traveling back to my childhood and then me in the womb of my mom. And I thought, okay, cool. Like, that's where it's going to stop, right? But no, I traveled all the way down like the, the line of creatures and all of a sudden it was the consciousness of a lizard. But not just the consciousness of one lizard, it was the consciousness of lizards. So I was like, okay, I, was, I found myself in the state of being where I was a creature, maybe not a lizard, I don't know, like a creature that was yeah. on land and in the water. And then all of a sudden he entered the water and I became a fish and then it, it kind of broke down the fish broke down into the, the molecules of the water and then it broke down even smaller 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 and then it exploded into the universe so yeah this, this <laughs> was a very interesting and then just for a light machine it was such a cool experience wow and yeah it's i don't know i uh, yeah must sound weird <laughs> no i mean I think every single person has um, a view of consciousness, which they would say must sound weird. But <laughs> it's because no one can pinpoint exactly what we think things are because you can't pinpoint what you are because you're the one trying to pinpoint what you are. Yeah. Which makes it so much more difficult. It's like the, the <laughs> finger can't point at itself. Um, yeah. It'd be very hard, at least. You could try to do it. <laughs> you have to be uh, double jointed. Um, chop yeah. it off. Yeah, yeah. Chop, chop it off. Them. Point it back. Although then you got then it's yeah. the conundrum: is the finger now over there, and is this a different finger? Because 
or <laughs> other than we're getting into. There's just a whole nother realm of stuff. But I wanted to return to the uh, the warrior mothers. I thought that was such an interesting phrase. And is there a story behind how you think about warrior mothers or um, one of the ways that you approach it? Well, no, for me, it's it's not really. Um, I think we all we all are warriors, mm -hmm. and we're all as well are the loving side of it. And I think sometimes, yeah, it, it just came to mind when we think about heroes, when we think about people of impact. We yeah. sometimes do forget the people that are struggling in everyday life. Like, you know, I'm not saying that single mothers are the, the only ones struggling. And I would, I would not even know, like my parents yeah. are still in a very loving relationship. Um, but I, it more defines to me that there is so much heroism in the world and yeah. people s struggling through life on different ways and different paths. And, of course, you have the struggle of poverty and you have the struggle of, of so many more things. But um, what I sometimes find is, especially with uh, single mothers or <clears throat> with people that are dealing, uh, single fathers from the same, same perspective, yeah. that people that are dealing with a, a life that is really asking a lot from them. And that oh, yeah. you you are working, taking care of the kid in the best way you can, and then probably you get judged from from people around you to do this, to that, yada yeah, yeah, that to just do different things in a different way to be better, and to, you're under a lot of pressure because of course you want to raise your kid as best as possible, and sometimes these are the heroes that we don't see that these are the heroes that we judge for what they're doing and it's so so easy to judge and say okay do this better do that better do your meditation do your yoga um prepare plant-based food because otherwise your kids will and then you kind of you're constantly judging on yeah. what other people aren't and what they are not achieving rather than seeing the hero with like heroistic yeah. i don't know deeds that they're doing and that they're really uh trying their hardest and maybe that is what a hero is for me somebody who just tries their hardest to get it right totally. and you can't really do more than that so. yeah so i know you, you you brought up spoken word a few times inq i'm sure you know INQ. um he has a great spoken word it's change yourself change the world like stop focusing on the world change yourself yeah and like that's the whole concept of it um i like spoken word as well me and my friends used to uh try to rap to each other oh, but cool. i realized i could just do spoken word way better because i could i have that like ever generative like turing machine in my brain where it's like word 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 and it like yeah. time coming out and i'm like oh cool like i could just sit here and ramble yeah when did you get into spoken word and do you write any of your own? Um, I don't know. I think it got into it when I was really in my teenage years. Um, yeah, I really resonated with some, some spoken word artists out there. And um, yeah, I do, I do write my own sometimes. So I'm not actively within the scene that like I don't yeah. perform, um, but I just really I write to to deal with things and sometimes I do post them on like non-spoken word like just just on paper mm -hmm. um, but yeah it's for me a way of reorganizing my thoughts and redefining my thoughts for me and then yeah sometimes uh, a poem gets out of that sometimes it's just crumbled words that you can't even read <laughs> but it's just yeah to me to deal with things or to yeah to really organize myself and yeah sometimes sometimes a poem pops out <laughs> yeah so do you have any mantras or anything because it sounds like you're very intentional with the way um that you try to think nowadays oh a mantra um or a repetitive phrase. Anything. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say like right now I don't don't really have that many that many mantras. 
um, normally when I'm really, when I'm in the cold and when I'm yeah. really pushing myself, uh, I have this, this mantra that maybe could be offensive to some people, but to me, it, it's pain just hurts. Yeah. To me, it's a reminder of the pain that I feel in the eyes. Mm -hmm. It's just a sensation. You know, yeah. It, yeah. it's our bodies telling us something about ourselves. And sometimes also emotional pain. It just hurts. And it's something that signals to you. And once you start seeing the pain as a signal, rather mm -hmm. than the thing itself, for me, it became something that I then could shift a lot. Yeah. Because then all of a sudden, it was a signal. Just like thirst is a signal for you to go drink something. Pain became a signal that, okay, there is something that I have to look at, or something that I have to deal with. But yeah, this, this is... Awesome. Pain just hurts. That's yeah. awesome. No, that is awesome. Yeah, I, I, I have a couple. I try to keep my brain tuned into what I'm, uh, what I'm really focusing on for the time being. So I love mantras. Um, I did want to move into real quick before we jump into uh, kind of a different style of questions. Um, mm -hmm. What's your training nutrition like for approaching the cold, for doing uh, these feats of what a lot of people would go, I, uh, yeah, I'm never going to do that. Um, well, at the moment, I'm training my breath hold a little bit, but I haven't, I haven't really been training as much because I've been traveling like crazy mm -hmm. and busy with the event. And most of my training actually does start more in the winter times. Um, so for obvious reason that the water is then colder and it's a lot easier. And I mean, these days when it's really hot outside, like it's th 38 degrees now, yeah. the cold has a different effect. Like it's, it's cooling you down, but it's not yeah. this psychological, at least not for me anymore. Like it's not a psychological thing because it's so hot that you really like the cold. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I do some breath hold training and then normally when I'm hardcore training when I'm actually training. I do sit in the ice bath at least once or twice a day and I train my breath hold. Um, but then most of the time, I'm literally out there in a lake just mm -hmm. enjoying, having fun, enjoying the scenery. Um, yeah, training for me, it's, it's a lot of mental training as well. Like, yeah. how do I? how do I overcome my own limiting beliefs? Because if I set a goal to do something, people always tell me it's impossible. Like people always tell me like, are you sure danger, this, this, and this. And then like, Oh, who's going to be your safety diver? And what is this going to be? And what if like now we have a trip planned um, in November mm -hmm. to free dive with killer whales. And it's a really cool project. That's and I'm awesome. super excited about it. But then people tell me like, oh, what if you get eaten? What if you get bit? <laughs> like, like it's, you know, and I'm like, yeah, it's in, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to train for these type of things is really just training to stay relaxed no matter what. And I do a lot of visualization training. Like when I have a project, when mm -hmm. I have, um, yeah, set a thing that I really want to achieve, swim a certain distance or swim in an environment where I've never been before. Um, I go over it in my head. I would say 20, 30, 40, 50 times. Nice. Because I go over every single thing that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And this is not uh, a negative way of thinking. But for me, it's, it's a way of, okay, how can I be ultimately prepared? Yeah even if I haven't been there. So exactly. I go over my head and what happens if I lose a fin? What happens mm -hmm. if I can't see my safety diver? What happens if I get a cramp, if I get cold, if I get water in my goggles, if I lose my goggles, if I lose this, if I lose that? What happens if there is something wrong with the other person that is saving me? What happens if I can't reach the boat? What happens if I have to stay in the water for longer? So yeah. I go over all these things and then I realize like no matter what, I'll be okay. And when I'm actually doing it, I also do the action or the, the thing within my mind. Okay, mm -hmm. 
um, even if the boat is not able to reach me for another five minutes, am I going to be okay? And then I try to signal to the boat that they should come and get me yeah. or to my safety divers or to the people involved um, that I want to go back. That, yeah, right when I know that I could stay in longer. And I know that I'm going to be okay if this doesn't happen straight away. So I think this is more how I prepare for a dive or for a shoot or for something just to go over it and to go over every single thing that can go wrong and then know that I will be able to deal with it. Awesome. So prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I love that. I mean, I think it's so key. And with the visualization, you might like uh, Dr. Jerry Epstein. He talks about uh, using, he actually did some research into using visualization for healing and a few things yeah. like that. Um, very interesting guy. Um, how far, how deep are you guys going? How long are you normally in this frigid water? Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's not really about depth mm -hmm. normally. Um, because, yeah, that could be a little bit more complicated because then mm. normally you have, just out of safety, you have a line. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you're attached to the line and you, you're not very flexible. So normally we stay between, yeah, at the surface and 10 meters, mm -hmm. um, just out of safety reasons because there are so many things already yeah. that, yeah. Um, but I would say, um, I don't really normally say okay i stay in for this long yeah. because it really depends uh it really depends on how my body is and i would now i'll be able to say like okay my personal best is this amount of time this amount of water mm -hmm. but that's not me every single day yeah. so yeah. i really don't want to define myself with like okay i can stay into minus three degrees of water for over this amount of minutes yeah. because tomorrow I might not be able to do that. So, yeah, yeah I, I do think, like, I stay in for as long as my body allows me to. Yeah. And I think it's really listening to these small um, whispers of the body. And if you start recognizing them, like, I know now how my body reacts to the cold. Yes. I know what hurts first. I know how my thinking is because the thinking slows down. And if I can't really hold a thought straight anymore, I know like, okay. Um, then I check with certain things like to me, my vision alters. So yeah. I always take a focus point and then if I can't focus on that anymore or it becomes blurry, I know like, okay, now my body is giving me a signal to, get the hell out <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah well that's awesome though that's a a lot of body awareness and with something like that it is uh definitely crucially important to be able to take those cues so i did want to transition into uh a few questions that i always love to ask which is what is your higher leverage skill and so a higher leverage skill is something that you can learn in one field um, but then you can pick it up and apply it basically anywhere. So a few of them is uh, learning to breathe properly because then you can, you know, work out better, meditate better, do all these other things better. Uh, learning to learn because then you can learn anything yeah. faster, better. Um, pattern recognition. Those are like a few examples I always give. Yeah. Is there anything, it could be a mindset, a tool, a trick that you use for most things that really help you uh, get to where you are today? Um, yeah, I would say recognizing this switch, mm. recognizing that, um, you can have thoughts, but you don't have to give in to them. And I think this is such a learning process. Like, um, sometimes I wouldn't say struggle, but I know that people expect me to have the answers mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm still figuring this out. I've learned yeah. something. I've learned something from the cold, but I'm still figuring out how I really implement that in my daily lifestyle. And it's a process of growing. And um, yeah, I think the more and more you start to learn that, the more and more you realize that, okay, you know, 
very classically, I'm not my thoughts. Mm -hmm. These are not things I have to give into. I'm not my past. I'm not my future. I'm not the mistakes I make. Yeah. And what I always say to people, like realizing that people have hurt you, but you have hurt people. You yeah. have made mistakes. Others have made mistakes for you. But the beauty of it, you're going to make so much more mistakes in the future that you can just forget about them in the past yeah. because you have so many mistakes ahead of you and just forget it. Like nobody, literally nobody can be perfect. And I think we all have this um, extraordinary parts within us. But yeah, yeah this, is, this, is, this is not a, like, not a line. It's, it's a bumpy road and then you explore something about yourself and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this now for six weeks. And then all of a sudden you stop for one reason or another and then you yeah. forget about it and then you have to relearn it again. So I would say to people like there is a switch and yeah. if you train this switch, it's going to give you a lot more in life. It's totally. going to give you so much power over your own thought patterns. So, yeah. <laughs> I love that. No, I love that. I also like the, uh, the like realize like you're not you who was in the past in a sense. Um, there's a philosopher, I forget his name, but I think he was in the 1700s and one of his thought experiments was uh, what if today was your first day existing, but you were put here with all the experiences and memories and everything. So yeah. you thought you lived yesterday and everything before, but everything started right now because you wow. would have no ability to tell that. So I love that little frame shift because you're like, yeah, I guess okay. then you could be whoever you want to be today. So is there anything right now though that you're currently questioning? So this could be life, religion, politics, the way doorknobs work, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but it's something that common consensus goes, you know, it works like that. It has to work like that. You're like, I just, I don't think it works like that. Um, yes, because uh, when I teach, when I teach other people the Wim Hof method, mm -hmm. um, the breathing has so many known benefits and has so many uh, science and research behind it that I, I hundred percent trust that the breathing has its place. Yeah. But current research actually started to highlight a little bit that this breathing might just change your mindset. And then it's the mindset that makes you able to cope with things better. So I am really currently thinking, okay, how, because I think when you see yeah. the Wim Hof method and you see the extreme things that he does, there are so many other people that found another way of doing yep. the exact same thing that I'm like, okay, maybe the power lays, how do we alter our mindset and how do we think from something impossible to something that we really can overcome? And I think this is runners who run an ultra marathon. Yeah. This is, this is the, the yogis that can shift themselves in the weirdest, weirdest poses. This is, but this is so much, so much in our lives that starts with the self belief. And I think this is so much more powerful. Like the latest um, study on Wim Hof, it's called brain of a body. Mm -hmm. It's how our brain alternates one particular part. Um, yeah, in our brainstem that then sends a signal down our spinal cord yeah. to inhibit pain on the first order neuron. So it inhibits the pain yeah. just when you receive it, when you receive it on your finger and then it goes through your spinal cord, there it already inhibits it. So this is, if, if it's truly possible to switch on this thing with our mm. mind, then if you just could yeah teach people how to really do this how to alternate their own brain yeah. and their own mind to send an order or to send a signal down to your spinal cord to inhibit this pain there is a huge potential there yeah. and it's of course it's not um, clear-cut knowledge yet it's not clear-cut science and science is constantly improving and I would honestly say to me maybe this this whole doorknob thing is <laughs> science because yeah. science is a process it's totally. not the answer it's not the question either uh -uh. It, 
evolving. And some things that science said are already debunked and then they get really, it's, it's always like this, this um, exactly. ping ponging, I don't know. And then they realize something and then we're like, shit, the body is so much more complex than we actually yep. knew. It's constantly evolving. So I think, honestly, don't take science that seriously. I mean, yep. I'm a science geek, totally. Uh, I love science. I love the research out there. I love everything about it. But don't take science for the one singular truth. Yeah. And especially like with things that you just mentioned, that consciousness. Yeah. Does exactly. science know yep. where consciousness comes from and who has it, who doesn't have plans it? Does and yeah, it's so much that we if we look intuitively, mm -hmm. we actually know that animals have consciousness. Yeah. Because you can see it. You can see it in the dogs. You can see it in the cats. You can even see it in the dolphins out there. You yeah. can see it if you look into the eye of a whale. You know there is so much within them. But then we really like to say, like, no, human consciousness yeah. is We've... more divine. Um, but these are things that we intuitively know, but we just don't know how to scientifically prove them. Exactly. And I think the balance between intuition and science is sometimes a little bit too much to the science side. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a, a huge skew right now in people. We live in this crazy time where, like, theoretically all information is available to us, but it's all information of what we thought we think um, yeah. or we've proved when most things are still hypothesis. Like, even uh, uh, natural selection and Darwin is still yes. a theory because it's yes. not actually been able to be proven in anything. Uh, there's no double blind placebo studies. There's nothing <laughs> like, you can't take evolution and be like, okay, yeah. we're going to have this, these people do that, those people do that. And so it is one of those mindsets that once you start to understand that science has flaws and that we can only, literally the brain can only see a certain range of frequencies, everything. Like we think about the light spectrums and like yeah. there's actually women in on earth that can see uh, they have four different color receptors. Um, so they can actually see a different color than most people. Yeah. Um, which is like so strange. I don't even know what that, I mean, I can't comprehend that. It's, I actually, it's so funny. Like I had, um, I just met a person who is going to be on my event. And when yeah. I was talking to her over the phone, she said, it's so interesting because she had eye surgery. Yeah. And actually something went terribly wrong. But she said, now I can see this infrared light. I can see things. I can, and my eyes all of a sudden yeah. pick up this thing. And first of all, I thought it's really annoying. What is it? And, or, or like, I honestly must say now, I'm not 100% sure if it was yeah. like ultraviolet or infrared, yeah, yeah. I don't know, something. But she said, I can see something that I couldn't see before. And it's everywhere. That's and I awesome. thought this is so interesting. And she said, like, I'm still officially blind, yeah. but I can see something. I can see that there is something more that I've ever seen before. Yeah. And once, like, her vision is coming back, maybe that then goes away. I don't know. Mm. But it showcases, like, there are so much things that we can't see, yeah. that we can't grasp, that we can't even think about being exactly. out there. And it, this is so interesting. And for me, as an ocean lover, like cuttlefish are really yeah. one of these examples of like, if you, if you see them, if you see how they can change their skin into bumpiness or non-bumpiness, if, if you see how they can communicate with light on their body, like they send these waves out. And if you see the mates, like I was lucky enough to, to be in a cuttlefish aggregation, you see that these males, they they approach the female and then on one side they're like giving out the nice colors yeah. to the female and on their other side of the body they're giving out the danger sign to other males really so swimming next to this female half danger half nice just to always show the female the nice side of themselves that's it's funny so cool. like there is so much going on that and then yeah there's it's yeah, just to me, it blows my mind how, oh, yeah. how we then can think like there is not consciousness in these animals or whatever. 
Yeah, and then we get tied up in all of our own stuff, and we're just like, the earth is so horrible. And it's like, dude, you're in one area in one part of the earth, and you've never actually seen how anything works. Yeah. And nature's just playing a whole joke on us. So is there anything that you're currently obsessed with? Ooh. I would say um, with other people, um, I really started to be very interested in, in how, how can you not just speak to a person, but how can mm. you really connect? And um, this is probably not really an obs obsessive kind of way, but I'm trying to kind of shift my mindset on the, the approach of people and how, how can I communicate even with a language barrier? How can mm -hmm. I connect to people in a certain way and I'm really trying to to navigate around that like how can I really yeah really touch on a different aspect of, of the human beings and maybe I'm slightly obsessed with trying to yeah to shift this mindset within myself and yeah. to see what what you can achieve when you when you're truly there, and maybe in coming back to the mantra that came now into my head, um, I'm really obsessed with the, the quote, um, show up to give, not to get. Yeah. So I try to focus my whole life now around, okay, if I do this, if I create something, how is it beneficial for others? And if people are involved in my business, so I now have a few people who are helping me with Disturb the Comfort, as a brand, as a trademark, yeah, yeah. like how can I really make it their business? Because yeah. if they can have their vision within my business, I think that's the only way I can, can give back to them. Because of course you give them a salary, like of course stuff yeah, yeah. like that comes in the end. Right now I'm very low on funding, but <laughs> um, of course this financial aspect is going to be playing a role, but I don't want to buy people's hours i don't yeah. want to buy people like i don't want to buy their life i want yeah. to create something and of course it's going to be under a brand that came i don't know up in my head but how can i really give something back and even yeah. with the events i'm trying like okay how can i give back while actually not yeah. even being profitable like i think this is maybe something i really got from ryan yeah. Like, how can I be a better human? How can I yeah. be better, do better, and be more significant? Even yeah. if it's not making sense yet to donate money to charity, how can I still make it work? How can I still see, like, okay, 10% of all my courses are going yeah. to charity, even if it's not profitable for me? Because I think so many people are saying, like, okay, once my business is grown, I'm going to yeah. donate. Once my business is grown, I'm going to give back. But when you're already in that loop, when you're already giving back as you go, yeah. you all of a sudden create something that has a really positive, positive vibe added to it. So with my events, I'm really aiming for a few things. And sometimes they have to compromise just because it's not yet 100% possible, but yeah, yeah, yeah. with my events, um, I try to have all the meals plastic free. So no plastic wrapping involved, That's no awesome. plastic anything. But then of course, if people have stands and all of that, they, yeah. yeah, they sell sometimes something in plastic. And this is something I cannot make it 100% plastic free yet, but yeah. I can create everything that's coming from my hands mm -hmm. being plastic free. So the lunch, the food, the things I'm really minimizing the flyers I put out there just because oh. every flyer is waste. Of course, yeah. people yeah. look at it, but these days people can take a photo of it. Like if yeah. there is, if there are ten flyers out there, I say, okay, here is your um, yeah, your virtual like QR yeah. code, and yeah. then you have your then you have your flyer on yeah exactly. on your phone. So it's really how can I have an event that is as minimal waste as possible? How can I event? Because from my beliefs, I think um, we all need to eat less meat. Mm -hmm. And I'm a vegan. I don't want to force this up on people, yeah. but 
I do want my event to be vegan just because yeah. otherwise it's yeah. not aligned with who I am. Yeah, exactly. So my events are vegan. Um, but yeah, then again, like, I don't promote this as a thing. It's mm -hmm. just how do you vend this? It's just the food that you get. It's vegan. Like yeah. no big deal. Um, then I really want to donate money like one, like a few percent of the income, uh, really donating it to a good cause and supporting friends and family and all these kind of things with it. And that is kind of how I'm now building, not just my business, but all yeah. the other side projects I'm doing as well. I kind of shifted away from um, the idea of, yeah, the world is something I can take from. But to yeah. me, I'm kind of away from this consumerism. I'm really looking to buy consciously. And of course, I have still clothing that I had for yeah. like five, ten years that are not this, this bio cotton wool or whatever. But I'm making the decisions I can afford and make right now, yeah. which is to buy less plastic, to make more myself, and to really see what can I do to have as minimal impact as possible. And sometimes that is really going somewhere over land. Yeah. And sometimes that's also being okay with myself if I have to fly somewhere. Because mm -hmm. I used to blame myself so much for, oh my God, my, my footprint is so ginormous because I'm flying to give yeah. a talk somewhere. Like I fly to the US because I give a workshop or a talk somewhere. And then I was like, maybe if I fly there, the impact I can have on exactly. people yes. is a different balance. And I would never say, okay, like I'm now going to fly for a holiday mm -hmm. there and there. But then I was like, okay, what can I do to make yeah. this flight really worthwhile? To make yeah. it into an effort that gives back to whoever is involved. Exactly. Yeah. That is phenomenal. Creating a community um, and they will help fulfill the thing with like the carbon footprint a lot of times too with the flight, like if you go there and you inspire a hundred people to go make a change, then I guarantee you reduced it by 10 X of what yeah. the one flight was. Yeah. So it's a very, you know, you can't necessarily measure every again with science. It's like, you can't be like, well, okay, John's now recycling all this stuff. And like, he stopped doing this. So like he, I reversed the one plane ride, but the more that you understand, yeah, that, you I think, yeah, I really love that. Really, really love that. And I think it's, for me, it's how, to me, veganism works. Like, it's yeah. not about not eating meat. It's not about not doing this. And yeah. sometimes I find people who are vegan, they can be very pushy and uh, like, yeah. other people yeah. blame them for and eating meat. But it's, how can you be compassionate? How mm -hmm. can you not be compassionate to all animals, human and non-human? And for me, that is deciding not to eat it. But if that is for you a different train of thought, mm -hmm. it's all about awareness. If you are aware of what you do and aware of what you eat, then I would really say, okay, enjoy it. Yeah. And if, it, if you are aware of it and it's a conscious decision, I think the, like, the other end of, of being conscious and uh, conscious about your food and conscious about it, yeah. it's, not necessarily vegan, it's just awareness on what you what you put into your system and yeah i think this is the exact thing if you really like your grandma's chicken soup mm -hmm. then eat your grandma's chicken soup but don't let that chicken soup be an excuse to eat steak every night yeah and yeah, this yeah. is what a lot of people do i could never be vegan because my grandma's chicken soup and yeah. I'm like, this is not the point. Then eat this one thing that you really exactly. would want to eat, but be aware of the things that you're putting on your bread that are totally not serving you. Mm -hmm. And it's not about black and white. It's about what serves you best. And yeah. yeah. Conscious intention. And that's yeah. one of the things that I mostly focus on, which is like with anything, it doesn't matter eating, it's with like all things in life, you are doing something, make it conscious. And then you can create it into what you want it to be. Yes. And then stop thinking about it again. Because like once I'm re I'm rereading, I love Napoleon Hill, but I'm rereading uh, Outwitting the Devil, which is like his conversation with the devil. But mm -hmm. the devil talks a lot about rhythms. Um, and one of his things is 
a habit is developed once a rhythm gets uh, sound enough, basically embedded into you. And so with all those things, uh, morning routine, oh, I just, I don't have the time for it. I'm just, no, you do because you're, you're doing a morning routine regardless of if you're being yeah. conscious about it. So be conscious about it, let it go for a little bit and then stop thinking about it because you yeah. create the rhythm, which creates the habit. And it's exactly what you were saying, regardless of the, the style of eating, be conscious about what you're eating because otherwise you are eating something. And if you're not conscious about it, it's probably not what you actually even want to be eating in the first place. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's it's so very, interesting. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a really good quote. I wrote it down. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I, I think a lot about minimalism lately. Minimalism to me or what I think it really is. Cause I kind of tried to live out of basically just a suitcase, a backpack and a camera bag, um, is, simply being conscious with everything otherwise yeah. it's like what are you why why do you own that thing but oh uh, i don't know it's cool like yeah you own this because it's cool no you own it because you bought it at some point and forgot that you even have it <laughs> yeah that's that's so true and i think we actually have a guy um speaking about minimalism on the mm -hmm. on the event as well just because it resonates so much with me and i was like minimalism is not just the things that you have yeah. but it's also the thoughts that are not serving you it's, it's what clutter do you have in your mind and what exactly. clutter do you have in your body that is not serving you at your core and okay really i mean honestly i own a lot of books because <laughs> i love them me and too. this this just makes me very happy yeah. if i see a yeah. nice notebook so yeah. every time i see a nice notebook i have so many of these like like oh, yeah. golden golden book things mine's, <laughs> i mean mine's even embroidered <laughs> um, yeah i'm ridiculous with them too. Yeah. and but then i flip through them and i'm like okay these are my thoughts these yeah. are my like diaries these are these are my business plans because i hate typing them on my laptop but i write my whole business plan even if i write it down i, I just write it on paper and I, like i have a page for quotes and lessons and things and i really love that i have so yeah. many of them yeah. and i would say it's not minimalistic at all but then i really try to say okay but i don't need this equipment yeah. i don't need yeah. this amount of clothing i don't need this i don't need that because it's not bringing me happiness yeah and if owning 10 books to write in <laughs> yeah. me happiness then yeah Exactly. Yeah. I actually get stopped at airports because I bring so many books in my backpack that oftentimes when I go through the, the scanner, they open my backpack, take out all the books and shake them to see if I have something. In I'm like, no, I'm just reading a lot. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. So before we sign off, where can people find you? Um, yeah, so I have Instagram, Facebook, I do have Twitter, but don't do anything with yeah. it. So yeah. I've actually got a few emails of like, please, like, get active on Twitter. And I'm yeah. like, eh, don't really use that. Like um, so yeah, I would say Facebook and Instagram are good places. Um, for the event and information about the business, it's www.disturbthecomfort.com. Um, yeah, so I would say those are the main pages. Then I do have a personal page, kikiboss.com, which is yep. currently under construction. So yeah, those are the few few places where people can find me. And if you want personal engagement, I'm in Berlin at the moment. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll have everything in the show notes linked out as well. Thank you so much for taking the time. This was an awesome chat. Thank you so much for having me, man. Cool. Of course. I'm um, sure we'll be talking soon too. Yes. Yeah.